It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. It's the Jill on Money show. We are so delighted you are joining us today. It's the first weekend in May. It Who knows what day it is? I don't know when you're listening to this, and I certainly can't tell you what day it is when I'm recording it, because every day is like the next day. It's unbelievable. It is the uh, coronavirus extension here on the Jill on Money show, and we are broadcasting from the Capital One Virtual Studios. Capital One, what's in your wallet? It's been quite, it's just been amazing. I can't believe another month is behind us. It's, I guess that really for, for me, the beginning of this crisis dates back to sort of the March-ish area. That's when markets started to gyrate. But I happened to look up the first time that I had written anything about the virus. And it's kind of weird because I, I, I didn't, I guess, going back in time and looking at that, on February, it was January 31st was the first time that I actually wrote about this. And I went back and I realized how wrong, not wrong, but it was like the, I had so many, I had like the understatement of the century in, because I wrote about it as a blog post. And I said, listen to this. I said, we don't know the lasting impact. There is likely to be at least a short-term effect, which could cause ripples that are worth monitoring. I mean, really, that has got to be the most, the craziest understatement, at least of the year and probably of the decade. So it is with us. The It's just been, it's been swift and it has been horrible, not just the spread of the virus, but the economic impact. and. We also know that the the impact on individuals has been sudden and pretty horrible. So with millions of people out of work, and maybe you're one of them and you're listening, if you need some help, just send us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com, Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. That's what we'd like you to do. So we got an anonymous email. Um, who would like to ask about electing a pension early. I'm 54 years old. I'm single. I have no kids and I own my own condo. I'm a psychologist and I have a job working at a university and uh, in and sounds good. She uh, says, uh, my job's okay. I make good money, about $100,000 a year. I recently completed a doctorate. I'm anxious about the student loans that are kicking in starting in June. Hmm. The monthly bill will be about $500. I've been worried for a long time about how I was going to pay for it. After paying for my mortgage utilities and insurance, I have a total of $2,600 a month in disposable income. Okay. That's not bad. So of that, I set aside $250 a month for savings outside of my 401k. The rest, food, transportation, personal care, larger expenses, insurances, household needs. Okay. So before the pandemic, here was the plan. It was, I was going to use the $200 a month earmarked for savings plus $200 a month from my anticipated increase in salary that was supposed to come and lower my 401k contributions to, to get to that $500 that I need. All right. Here's the problem. Now with the pandemic, no raises will be going on. I lost money in my retirement account. I'm leery about reducing my contributions to my 401k. I tried to do a cash out refinance to roll my one credit card debt into my mortgage. Since I have a good deal of equity, my bank has frozen cash out refis because uh, appraisers are canceling appointments. Hmm. So I need to figure out how to pay the $500 in student loans come June. I still can use the $200 earmarked for savings, but I can't really carve out another $300 a month from my disposable income to make up losing that salary increase. Okay. 
got this all now. So we got to come up with 500. We can only get 200. And, you know, again, this person is only 54. So I don't think cutting back on the retirement contributions is great either. So let's see if there's another way here. There is an opportunity from a prior employer where I am vested in a pension and eligible to elect retirement. If I do so now, listen to this, my monthly gross income would be $950 a month after taxes, about $600 a month. However, I would lose about $440 a month if I were to elect retirement now than in 10 years. Hmm. Here are my options. Elect early retirement, cut budget by $300 a month, get a new job paying a little bit more now, probably unlikely. Try to earn additional side income offering career coaching. <sighs> all right. First of all, I wonder if this is a federal loan or a private loan. I'm going to guess it's a private loan. What do you think, Mark? I think private loan because otherwise she wouldn't be having to pay anything at least until September 30th. Um, okay. I'm just looking here. So you've got a bunch of money that's right now earmarked for other things. And I just went and read through that, that call that, you know, column of like what that paragraph rather of what you're going to, so you have it for personal care, larger expenses, long-term care insurance. I want to know about that charitable contributions, household needs, car maintenance, budgeted travel to see my family over the holidays. Hmm. What's the, so what do you think about this? I, I look, I, I like the idea of somehow or other figuring out how to tighten up the budget and come up with a $500. Because then I think if you do that right now, you're not going to, don't worry about travel anytime soon because you're not doing that. I'm a little concerned about tapping the pension right now because it feels like this could be a temporary situation that might resolve in six months or eight months. Um, so I don't want to tap that pension right now. Um, but I, I, and and I and and in fact, you're probably better off like foregoing the saving of that you know that extra money for saving right now because who cares? You don't need that. You don't need two hundred dollars of the savings. Is there somewhere else we can squeeze this budget, this $300 a month? Is there a way? I'm more inclined to find a way to do that. And I, I also would look at um, staying on top of that refinancing because I think that while you still have a job and you still have good income, that there is an opportunity for you to maybe get some of your interest payments lower. Um, I also would like to know one other thing before like we sort of call it quits on you today. And that is um, in, in your retirement account and, you know, you wrote this, let me just see when we got this the beginning of April. So we probably have now have a month later. I want to make sure that the money inside of that current retirement account is not too aggressive. That's really important. So do me a favor and send me your allocation as a follow-up, okay? Uh, all right, that's a tough one, but I don't think tapping that that pension now makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, let's go to a break. It's Jill on Money. Hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com. Sign up for our free weekly newsletter. You can see all the great stuff we do every single week, and we will be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and this is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. We are really focusing on the questions that you are sending us. So if you've got a financial question, please don't hesitate. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. That is our email address. And just want to follow up on the previous question. The, the idea that a mortgage company would not refinance right now because they can't do appraisals, well, Mark pointed out to me something that's obvious. He just refinanced and had the exact same situation. And it was really wild because obviously, no appraiser is coming into your house and 
no, nobody wants them in their home right now. But what Mark did was he was able to take photos of the house, of the apartment, and send them off. And then was there anything else you had to do, Mark, besides, because they had all the other information, right? They have the square footage. Did they, did they ask for a floor plan or anything? And Mark also followed up. He sent them a, for, a floor plan, pictures, and then they had all the other information. So they go out and they do the comps. They run the numbers and boom, he got, he got a refinancing done pretty, I wouldn't say easily, but efficiently considering. So yeah. I'm, and Mark said that, that he maybe not so subtly said, um, you know, here's the, here's what we hope this apartment is worth. That way we don't have to pay any points, but you know, that may not work for all of you. Anyway, I point that out because it's very, it was that your idea, Mark, or was it the appraiser's idea? Oh my gosh. So they asked the appraiser, could they do it that way? And the appraiser's like, yeah, sure. So interesting. I think that maybe we go back to the drawing board with that, um, in that question and go find out if you can actually do a refi. All right. God, it's crazy times. Oh, by the way, um, you know, the IRS has said that uh, they've issued, you know, I don't know, 100 million payments to taxpayers across the nation. Um, there are going to be 150 million of these economic impact payments uh, sent out. If you've changed your banking each situation in the last couple of years, the IRS may have your old information on file. So you really need to make sure that you go and update the right information on the IRS website. Okay. So do that. It'd be, it will behoove you to do so. Um, okay. Let's get to another question from Sunil. Okay. Thank you so much for your coronavirus series. Oh, okay. Cause Sunil is writing this because uh, we have a sister broadcast. It's called the Jill on money coronavirus market update. It's a podcast. So if you guys want that, you should absolutely download that anywhere you get your favorite podcast. Maybe you don't know where that would be. Well, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, radio.com, Google Play. That's it. Go there. Check it out. Okay. Let's go back to the question. Thank you so much for your coronavirus series. It has been so helpful and a voice of reason and stability through these challenging times. I listen to it daily. I ask this question having a lot of gratitude for my current state. A lot of people are suffering financially and physically, and I acknowledge that I have a lot to be thankful for. Good for you. So I understand if someone else's more urgent question gets answered instead of mine. Well, we're going to answer yours. Um, okay. I'm in my early 40s. I'm able to work from home through these times. I have a 401k that is valued at about $400,000. I have a $330,000 mortgage on a $550,000 house in a different state that I'm renting out. I refinanced recently and the rent the, and the mortgage match each other. I also have about $220,000 built in, of equity in that house. I've got $200,000 in cash that I had put aside for a down payment on a house. However, I've decided to postpone that decision and I'm looking and I'm holding on to the cash. I have very little in stocks, just beginning to build a portfolio, no credit card debt. I live in the Bay Area. What should I be doing at this time? Should I move some money from 401k to a Roth IRA, open a CD for the cash, wait a few months and buy a house, stay still and continue to be thankful? Thanks for all you're doing during these challenging times and stay healthy. Hmm. Well, let's see here. The four, So you have stocks because you have 401k. So we know that. Um, I'm wondering, it's you know, when you say, should you move money from a 401k to a Roth IRA? You're, I think that what you're saying is your current 401k is an active plan, and the plan itself would have to allow you to do that, to do this in-service once a year transformation, um, and you really have to make sure that they have that set up. Let's pretend they don't. Then we're just talking about $200,000 that you have set aside for a down payment on a house. And you don't know when you're going to buy that house. Are you postponing the decision for the house because things are uncertain in your personal life? In other words, is it possible that you could go and buy a house and really not have a ton of risk right now to your job. 
I, I sort of feel like if if you're postponing that because you're freaked out, that's fine. But it sounds like you still want to buy a house, in which case you got to leave the money where it is or at least put it into a, a high yield money market or a high yield savings account. So if you want a short term CD or you want to have access to that money in a money market or a savings account, go to depositaccounts.com, check out what's available. And I, I think that maybe, I just want you to revisit the idea. It's funny. It's like, you're already saying, I'm pausing. I want to wait. And I'm saying, well, why? If everything else is still the same. So if you really want to buy a house, go buy a house. You know, if you've, if you've made that decision and you've run the numbers. Okay. Jan writes that she is turning 65 this August. She's a widow. She's got an adult son who has mild cognitive disabilities and dependent on me as he does not qualify for social security or SSDI benefits. He works part-time. He makes minimum wage. We're investing a portion of that into a Roth IRA for him. His part-time medical benefits are awful and covers only preventative care with no other coverage. He doesn't qualify for health insurance on the Affordable Care Exchange as it, because his employer provides this meager health insurance. It's very worrisome to me. I'm currently drawing on my own Social Security, which goes to cover my medical premiums. I hope to switch to my survivor benefits next year at full retirement, which should adequately cover my monthly expenses and even allow me to save a little bit that's left over. I also have some money coming in monthly via a annuity with a 20 year period certain to help my son should I pass early. It currently pays my monthly expenses. My home is paid for, I have zero debt. I have about five years worth of cash and CDs for emergencies. Currently I'm invested 70% diversified stock index funds, 30% bonds, because this money has to grow sufficiently to fund not only my retirement, but also provide for my son's future. Is this allocation too risky for me, given my unique situation? Oh, Jan, Jan, Jan. Because you have the annuity that's coming in and you really don't need to access the money in this account, I guess what I'm thinking is that if, so let's, let's be realistic. Yes, of course, some, you may need some of this money, but essentially this is a portfolio for part of which is for a 65 year old and part of which is for a 35 year old. I would say this because you have this annuity and you have that money coming in and that's what, what pays your monthly expenses that seems to me the the difference here. I would definitely have said, oh my God, it's too much risk if you didn't have that. But with that, it's not too much. I wonder how you felt when you went through this period where markets were tanking. That's, a, I guess, a different question. I have to go to a break. I want to come back and do a little bit more about Jan. Is that okay, Mark? I'm, I'm going to just go to a break. I just want to talk a little bit more about this idea of allocation and what's appropriate. It's a unique case. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, send us an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And during the break, did you hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com? There's so much great stuff there. This is Mark's baby. It really is. I mean, I generate most of the content, but he's the mastermind behind the newsletter Um, If you'd like, you can see all the stuff that I've done on television. You can judge all of my outfits. Um, You can read various posts that I have written. You can listen to old shows. You can check out our resource section 
because we've got a lot of stuff up there around coronavirus and some of the things that are going on. But we also have some of the old stuff too. Remember the Secure Act? Remember when we cared about that, Mark? It seems like a million years ago. But there is a lot of good stuff there. So check it out, jillonmoney.com. I wanted to follow up on the email that we just answered about the woman who is 65 and she's investing a bunch of money, but it's really mostly for her 35-year-old son. And she asked about her allocation. And it's a 70-30 split, 70% equities, 30% bonds. And you know, she did very wisely say that the money's got to grow sufficiently to fund not only her own retirement, but also her son's future. And I think that unless you feel that going through these agonizing gyrations in markets was really hard for you, I think that this is a reasonable expectation that you could have a 70-30 portfolio. You're probably not going to need to tap it. And I think it's it's not, I mean, obviously, if you were 65 and living off this money, 70-30 might not do it. But also, you've got all that money that has been set aside in your emergency reserve fund, five years worth. I think this is just fine. I really do. Okay. Let's see. Kayla writes, oh, brother, I hate this email already. I quit my job at the early stages of the pandemic, which means I am now unemployed and ineligible for unemployment, and I'm uninsured. I'm lost. My finances are causing the most anxiety. My primary concerns are that I will run out of money. As a result, I'm scared to spend money on anything not essential. I'm even hoping to stretch essentials like food as far as possible by shopping once a month. I'm hoping some feedback will give me insight and maybe some comfort. So good news is, even though that uh, she's got no income, she's got no debt. That's amazing. Um, She's got emergency reserve funds, $24,000, and then another $9,000 in uh, saving for other goals. She's got... um, about $5,500 in a traditional IRA, $8,000 in a Roth IRA, and $43,000 in an investment account. Okay, here are the main questions. Should I get any job if I can so that I have some extra income? I'm concerned at getting a job with no insurance and getting sick would add insult to injury. What's a good game plan? Uh... No, you shouldn't get any job. It's funny. I don't know what job you had, so I'm interested in that. Um, Next question. Should I pause car insurance since I'm not using it? Yeah, you should call your car insurer and say that you're affected by the virus and you ask for some forbearance. You should also do that. I don't know where you're living, um, but you should do that for rent as well. Can I afford to invest in a career coach to give me direction? No, you cannot. You should not. Can I afford to invest in mental health, which I feel will be beneficial but not essential? Put it this way. I would totally invest in mental health but not in a career coach. Career, There's so much great career information out there. And um, so, no, don't do that. But what do you do? I'll be your freaking career coach and it'll be zero. What I would love you to follow up. I would love for you to come back and just follow up with me and see if we can kind of guide you here. You have money, okay? You have 40 something thousand dollars in an investment account. So that's number one. You've got an emergency reserve fund. So I don't think you need to just take any job necessarily, but I don't, I I think if you could get a job where you could get insurance, that would be the any job as long as it had insurance. I would be up for that. Um, But I would like more details. I want you to keep breathing. You have money. You have no debt and you have money. So you are making yourself crazy. I get it because it's crazy making right now. But let's be clear. I think you have some options. And maybe you don't see those options, but we do. Okay? I'm going to be this girl's career coach, Mark. What do you think? I'm ready to do it. That's going to be my pro bono, um, my, my, my pro bono act of the day. All right. Okay. Next up we have, oh, a Jill who says I am contributing maximum amount to my Roth IRA at Fidelity 
that is then transferred to eFidelity go fund for more growth opportunity. Am I supposed to leave it in just one Roth IRA or am I on the right track? Uh, I like just one. I mean, like you mean one account? I, I would just have one Roth IRA account that held all of my assets and I would have a nice diversified uh, group of index mutual funds or maybe one of those nice fidelity 20 something funds, you know, a general target date fund, but you don't have to go crazy. And all these other things seem a little bit more than you would need. So there we go. Okay. (sighs) Mark, blowing through these questions, feeling pretty good about myself right now. If you have a financial question, we would really like to help you out. Um, I want to hear from, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do a big call out. Who has kids going to college next year for the first year? Who is thinking about not allowing kids to go to college? Who's thinking about the idea that paying tens of thousands of dollars to do online coursework may not be the smartest financial investment of their lives? Who's rethinking college plans altogether? I want to hear from you. I'm very interested in this. I, I'm wondering if this is finally the, the tipping point on college where we, we know that a degree is worth something, but it may not be worth as much as you think. And now that you really see it for your own, in your like, wow, what, what, what am I paying for? It's the nice keg party in a crappy dorm room. I don't know. All right. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, shoot us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are trying to help you get through the financial aspects of this pandemic. And if you've got a financial question, just send us an email. It's askjill at jillonmoney.com, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Uh, okay. Um, these are such hard questions. Sometimes I, I don't even know exactly how to answer this. So I'm going to do my best. Mike writes, I'm retiring in two weeks. And when this market started to go down, I put all of my 401k into a cash or cash equivalent investment. So far, I've only lost $6,000. When I'm retired, what should I do with the fund? reinvest or something else. You may have gotten, I don't know how much money you had in the plan, so I can't judge whether $6,000 loss was great luck or not, but now you have the unfortunate task of trying to figure out where to go next. So a lot of this depends on your personal situation. You have timed the market on one side of the transaction. You have sold. Now when to get back in? Do you have any other sources of income? Do you need to live off of this money? That's sort of the the big question. And that will guide you as to what to do next. Because if you have a big fat pension and you never needed to tap this money, then maybe you should reinvest it slowly and very conservatively. But we need to know more information. You can feel free to send it in to us, but just know that this is why timing the market's so hard. I don't know what's going to happen next. I'm just, I, I have no idea. So I can't tell you about market timing. I don't know how to time the market. It doesn't, it, it just seems impossible to know that. All right. Tracy writes, um, I wanted to send a quick thank you for all the great work you do via the podcast, including the series of daily episodes during COVID-19. I spoke with you last summer in an episode that you aired in August. I'm on the path to FIRE, or at least FIRE uh, financial independence. So FIRE, financial independence, retire early. I was wondering if I should save more in taxable accounts for flexibility. 
Based on Jill's advice, for the remainder of 2019, I steered more savings into taxable savings and investment accounts as opposed to my mega backdoor Roth IRA through my employer's 401k plan. I am so happy I did that, she writes. Jill recommended that I would have more flexibility for a potential career change. And what I've realized since then is that having more liquidity in taxable accounts has really helped my peace of mind through the pandemic and the associated market volatility. If I lose my job, I feel much more secure now to weather that storm without having to use funds that are intended for retirement. When I talked to Jill last summer, I had $60,000 in taxable accounts, 25000 in emergency savings, 35000 in a brokerage account. I now have $105,000, $55,000 in the emergency reserve, $50,000 in brokerage accounts. Knowing I could live on $50,000 a year, I feel really great to have that amount in cash plus about another year's worth of expenses in taxable stocks and bonds. I know that I am fortunate and I'm thankful every day. I'm also thankful to you for helping all of your listeners make improvements in their own personal financial situations, whatever their needs or goals might be. Stay healthy and thank you. Wow, that is a darn good, nice note to get. Sometimes I was just saying this to somebody that there's a difference between giving kind of classic academic advice and then giving real world advice. And I'd like to think because of the unique way that I come to this position where I am right now in that I gave advice for a living and I am a certified financial planner, but that I understand in my early years when I was doing the financial planning process with clients, I tended to be, I don't know, a little didactic. And then I started to realize you've got to get people to meet you where they can go. And you also have to give people advice that is not just always the best financial decision, right? Because I remember this now. I mean, the idea of putting money into a mega backdoor Roth seems amazing except when it's not, except when something really horrible happens. And sometimes having a little bit extra money in your emergency reserve fund means that you don't have as much money invested. So when times are good, you might look at that and say, oh, I wish I had more money invested. And then when the when things turn south, you're so grateful that you have it. So often I find that a lot of financial advice givers – you know, the real ones, not the ones who are selling products, the the best ones just can do that, can take real life and give you the best advice for you in your situation. So I want to thank you for writing that note. And of course, I want to thank all of you for always writing these notes because this is so gratifying. Mark and I love this stuff. We're going to put a best of on Mark, like best questions and results ever. Anyway, really is. It's always a privilege to be here with you guys. And don't worry, we've got another segment to go. So you're listening to Jill on Money. During the break, why don't you just hop onto the website and uh, go, or maybe just go subscribe to that daily podcast. You can get it on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Radio.com, Google Play, anywhere else you can find podcasts. Okay, we'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And before we finish up the hour, here's a question which is interesting from Ernest. And he says, good morning, Jill. We have been struggling with a question we'd love some advice about. We were in the process of buying our first home before the virus hit. Now we are terrified of the economic repercussions of the pandemic. Would you recommend that we go through with the home purchase or pull out of the deal, assuming we could get our deposit back? So they already put a deposit down. 
Hmm. Okay. I guess there's a couple of questions. One, how secure are your jobs? That's a biggie, right? Really a big one. And number two, how much money have you allocated towards this purchase? Were you being really aggressive? Were you kind of using the best case scenario? Number three, did you find the house you really want to live in for the next, you know, bunch of years? I mean, presuming you've run the numbers and your jobs are secure, maybe going through with it is just fine. I don't know. I would be reluctant to pull the plug unless you, just because of your nerves, unless something in your own lives is changing. And maybe that's enough. I mean, maybe just the idea that we don't know or we're not really sure how much income we're going to have. In that case, then I would actually pull the plug because it's it's not a smart thing to go into a home purchase feeling like you're going to maybe be losing a bunch of money to reduced hours or income or, or anything like that. So tell me more about yourself and we'll be happy to help you out with uh, maybe diving a little bit deeper into whether or not you can afford this right now or whether it's time to just say, eh, I'm done with it. Okay. So follow up with us. Uh, okay. Hey gang, we have such a fun interview for you because uh, these are tough times and you know, what's great. We went back to the, uh, the archives and we've got an interview with Ken Langone, whose book is called I Love Capitalism. And it's tough to love capitalism right now, but he sells it well. So stay tuned. We're going to have an interview with Ken Langone. We'll be right back. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome back. It's hour number two of the Jill on Money show. And we are broadcasting from the Policy Genius Virtual Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. Just go to policygenius.com. I just got a a question from one of the insurance institutes out there, you know, which is basically an arm of the PR mechanism for the insurance industry. But anyway, the reason I point that out is they're starting to do some research to see if people have a renewed interest in life insurance amid a health pandemic. I'm kind of guessing yes. Okay. We got a special guest for you this hour. Fantastic. Ken Langone. And, you know, this guy has such an amazing history. He, you know, you could sort of say he's a billionaire, but he's a billionaire, businessman, investor, philanthropist. He's one of the guys who helped figure out how to put the money behind the idea of the Home Depot. So he graced us with his presence. He wrote a book called I Love Capitalism, An American Story. So we thought, he's an upbeat guy. Let's bring him back. So we got this from the archives. Here's the first part of our interview with Ken Langone. You were born to uh, Italian-American parents on the North Shore of Long Island. Yep. They, who's first generation, your grandparents or your parents? My parents are first generation. Your parents are first generation. Working class. Dad yeah, was a plumber? My father was a plumber. He went to the eighth grade. Yeah. My mother worked in a school cafeteria. She went to the seventh grade. And you lived on what you so, sort of describe as like the bad side of the tracks well, in was, a nice it was town. Where, it was where the poor people lived. Yeah. You know, we had a, I think my parents paid $4,000 for the house they bought, which they couldn't buy. And they were living, renting the house for a few years. It was, it was uh, right by the public school. How is it that your parents, who were not educated, were so encouraging that you become educated? Because a lot of people who grew up as tradespeople, children of tradespeople, mm-hmm. go into the trade. My father made me learn to be a plumber. On weekends in high school, I used to help him. So I could do all the things a plumber does, wipe a joint, hit a, hit a joint for copper tubing with lead, uh, thread a pipe, cut pipe, 
all the stuff. This is great because I need some work on my uh, well, Go my to Home apartment. Depot. We've oh. got a lot of people <laughs> that can really help you. And we've got great prices and everything you need, okay? Okay, so you learn, you learn the trade, but, but what was it that they knew about being educated? My parents, God bless them, didn't blame themselves for where they were. They felt if they had the chance for an education, they'd have done better than they did. And we used to go to my grandparents in Port Washington for lunch every Sunday. This is, they all got together. We would drive through a wealthy section of town called Roslyn Estates. And when we would drive through there, every time we'd drive through there, Mom would say to me, I was sitting in the back of the panel truck. She was sitting in the front on a, on a makeshift chair seat. And she'd say, would you like to live here someday? And I said, yes. She said, well, you're going to have to work hard and get an education. So she okay. knew. Okay. Well, they understood because they knew they could be capable of doing so much more, but they lacked the tickets. And meanwhile, you they're telling you be educated, and you say you weren't such a great student. Uh, I, I didn't. You know, I, <laughs> I wanted to make money. I hear you. You say it in, like, very plain English Wait, right here on page six. I loved making money. Yeah, I was. Hell, I, 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 I delivered newspapers. I was a caddy. I worked in a gas station. I worked in a butcher shop. I used to take the cardboard out from the liquor store. There was a supermarket in Rotherham called M&H that opened up. At the same time, I was working for the butcher shop, which was a competitor. At nights, I was helping them set up the store without the butcher shop knowing I was working two jobs. I mean, it's interesting. You say, I was never academically curious, and I didn't apply myself at all. So, But you did say math came easy to you, so that oh, was, was good. Numbers were just like that. Tell me about how you then headed to Bucknell University. How'd you get there? Understand that that I did okay in high school. Numbers and me got along very well, and I still do. Mm -hmm. I had pretty much convinced myself that I wasn't a student, and I wanted to go into the Marine Corps in 1953 because the Korean War was still on. Mm -hmm. My brother was in the Army, my older brother. I only had one brother. And I took the position that this is what I wanted to do. Well, Eisenhower had different plans at the end of the war, mm -hmm. so I said, what am I going to do? And I went to see friends of mine from Port Washington, Jim McNamara, J.R. Davis, Stan Cutler. They were at Bucknell. Uh, I went there, and it was house party weekend, and I said, Jesus, this is what you do in college. <laughs> I could do this really well. Well, this fits me. I, yes, I can execute so on this. So they had Saturday morning classes, and that morning, that Saturday morning, they said, look, we have to go to class. Why don't you go over and see the guy over in the building over there? He's the guy that lets people in. It was called the registrar. His name was George Faint. And I went over and I said, he said, I'm sitting there and he said, what are you waiting for? I said, well, my friend said I should come see you. What about? I said, well, I'm in high school. You're senior? I said, yeah, well, what are you going to do? I don't know. He said, well, come on in my office. So we talked for an hour. The following Thursday, I get a letter from him that if I want to come to Bucknell, he'd be happy to have me. That may be the best decision that anyone from the Bucknell ever made. No, the best decision anybody from Bucknell ever made, Yeah, and it's in the book, was my economics professor who wanted to know if anybody ever told me I was stupid. And I said, yes, everybody. And he said to me, you know the only sin? You believed it. And That's he great said, advice. And he said to me, how are you doing in your other classes? I said, about as bad as I'm doing in your class. He said, well, you know, you're going to be out of here in January. I said, yeah, I know that. And he said to me, is that what you want to happen? I said, no, I don't. He's okay. He said, I'll make a deal with you. I'll reach out to all your other professors. You promise me you'll work, give it everything you got, and we'll see if we can put you out of this nose dive. And they did. It's something interesting to me that many people will say the difference between someone making it and not making it, whether and you I know you're involved in the charter school movement. Right. It can be anyone from a coach, a music teacher, an academic mm -hmm. teacher mm -hmm. who just says, hey, you, you, Ken, what's going on here? And they see something in you. Yeah. I, look, every place I look, I see people that I know have helped me to do what I've done. And in many cases, have done more than I've done myself. And that is why you say you are not a self-made man. I am man. the furthest thing from a self-made man you'll ever know, okay? And I, I, my regret on that, I'm not regret, I hope I didn't, I, this, I don't know how many hundreds of names there are in there, but I hope I didn't leave anybody out. But if I did, it was a bad memory, yeah. not that they didn't participate. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how you left college and uh, you said you're going to go, you, you know, it's like... Uh, where the bank robber goes, he's going to go to the bank. Uh, that's where the money is. Right. You said the money's in Wall Street. So yeah. you graduate and you go talk to some folks. I do love this advice uh, from uh, Maurice Hart. And he says, quote, 
let me tell you the lay of the land. We have Jewish firms for Jewish kids. We have WASP firms for WASP kids. The Irish, we make the clerks. We put them on the floor of the stock exchange. Italian kids like you, we put in the back office. What did you think when you heard that? Uh, I didn't appreciate the fact that he was discrimination. But I know one thing. I made my mind up. That ain't going to hold me back. You have no idea the price we're paying for our entitlement system in America. Not the money, but the number of people that don't get a chance to develop self-respect by doing it for themselves. You've got to respect yourself first before you're going to respect anybody else. Somebody who has no respect for themselves has a difficult time seeing good in somebody else. I, I view that more as an opportunity than as a setback. But I always, I admired him. He was with a firm called New York Hanseatic, and I so admired him for being so thoroughly blunt with me. We'll be right back with our interview with Ken Langone. During the break, why don't you go to our website, jillonmoney.com. There you can read all the stuff that we've written or listen to past programs, watch some of the television appearances that I've been doing lately. And of course, check out that resource tab. A lot of really good information there, especially around all the programs with coronavirus. So we'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you have a financial question, we always love to hear from you. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Um, We have this great guest. And what we've done is, I think of the last couple of weeks, Mark and I decided we wanted to try to give you some different voices, maybe some optimistic voices. So last weekend, we had Admiral McRaven, who wrote the book, Make Your Bed, but also led the invasion, which resulted in the death of Osama bin Laden. Kind of cool, right? So we found that from our archive. And today we bring to you another favorite interview that we conducted with Ken Langone. And you you may have seen him because he's kind of out there guy, talks a lot about philanthropy. He gave a ton of money to uh, NYU hospital, Um, but he really has such a fascinating background as if you missed the first segment, you can go back and listen to it. What I think is interesting is here's a guy, he's in his 80s. He is very upbeat, not just about what happens in life, but kind of like how you navigate your journey. Not everything works out perfectly. And certainly he was a poor boy from the wrong side of the tracks. He made it big, no doubt. You know, he's a billionaire. But the journey was really interesting. He got his start on Wall Street, not at a fancy firm. Because as he noted, as a kid, as an Italian kid from Long Island, he was not going to get into the fancy firms. It just wasn't happening at that time. And how his choices led him in the direction of one very important person in Ken's life, none other than Ross Perot of EDS, Electronic Data Systems. So when he tells the story, it's really fascinating. It does go to show you that the way that you navigate the opportunities, what you put out there for yourself can reap unbelievable and unexpected returns. So here's more of our interview with Ken Langone. So I want to talk a little bit about how you did get into Wall Street selling securities, Mm -hmm. and that was in the early 60s, and and talk a little bit about what you did and how you then ultimately met Ross Perot. Okay. I was called back. I was in the Army once in in 58 for six months, and then I got called back when they built a wall around Berlin in 61. When I got out in June of 62, I made Wall Street had had the biggest crash that it had since 1929 in May, and everybody was leaving Wall Street, and I said, hey, this is my moment to strike. And my father-in-law, God bless him, he was in the business, and he set me up with a series of appointments. And the fact that people were leaving and the firms were cutting back, I kept going, and I, I really was getting discouraged, but I wasn't going to give up. I had a wife and one child and a second one due in September of that year. And I met a man, 
And he said to me, I'd like to hire you. I think it was Jack Cullen. He said, I'd like to hire you. But he said, we're cutting back and we just can't do it. And I said, but he said, I think you're going to be a big success. He said, I think you got certain talent. I said, what's that? He said, well, you strike me as a very sensitive guy. And that's a great, great talent to have hmm. if you're going to sell. So he thanked me and said he couldn't help me. And I got in the elevator and I went down to the floor, down to the lobby. And I got, well, thought to myself, I said, wait a minute. I went right back upstairs. And I said, I'd like to see Mr. Cullen again. And I went in. And he said, what's up? Did you forget something? I said, no. I said, let me ask you a question. What do you pay a secretary? He said, we pay him about 150 bucks a week. I said, can you pay me as a secretary? He said, what do you mean? I said, can you pay me 150 a week? He said, well, you can't make it on that. I said, no, that's my problem. I was teaching at NYU at night. Mm. By the way, consider this. Barely 10 years from when I was told I was going to get thrown out of college, I'm now teaching at one of the great business programs in the country. And so I said, I'll make it. Don't worry about it. So then I said, but there's only one condition. You have to give me every account you're not doing business with. And boy, then I went to work. That's great. And so you were selling. Selling like crazy. And you are a salesman at heart. I love selling. Even if you love the numbers, the selling, you're a relationship guy. That's the sensitivity that he saw. It's all about the people. Absolutely. And that includes companies. Mm -hmm. Great companies are run by great people. Home Depot is a success it is because we had people like Bernie and Arthur and Pat. These were our partners when we started the company, Mm -hmm. all right? And these men were unique and special in every respect. All right, let's get back to Ross Press. How'd you meet him? I went to a party in Washington in, in, uh, in 1968, and I met a man there who said he was Perot's partner and Washington representative. Now, I didn't know who the hell Perot was. I didn't know what he did, and he started telling me, and I said, gee, that sounds like that's interesting. And he said to me, I said, gee, I said, is there a chance I can get in to meet this man? He says, well, call me on Monday. I'll see what I can do. The name was Jack Height. I called Jack on Monday. He said, look, you got an appointment. He said two things. You got 30 minutes. And he said, don't use any bad words. So I said, And you're oh, a little rough on the on the bad words. So. I am what I am. I know, me too. Okay. Can't do it here, but it is yeah. what it is. I understand. You know, if you live in a trading room long enough, that becomes, That's part, exactly. of, that becomes part of the territory. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I went down and I met with him. And exactly at the point I was supposed to get in, I got into his office. And we were 30 minutes. And... For 29 and a half minutes, he told me everything he'd heard from Goldman Sachs, Whitewell, Merrill Lynch, Clark Dodge, GH, all these firms that were really trying to get his deal. And when he got all done, it was about 30 seconds left. And he said to me, well, what do you think of what I just said? And I think, well, I blew the 30-minute rule, right? Right. So I said, Mr. Perot, I said, pardon me, that's the biggest pile of horse shit I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> that's awesome. And he looked back, he took back, and he said, what do you mean? And we talked for 13 hours. We talked till 1 o'clock the next morning. Good God. I had not brought any clothes down, so he was driving us around Dallas looking for a drugstore where I could buy some toiletries and a T-shirt. Oh, my God. And we found out in that meeting we were married the same hour, the same day, the same year. His values and his integrity was so precious. And I, I said to him, I said, I'll never throw a curve at you. And he said, oh, he said I was going to make a decision by Friday. This was Wednesday. He says, I'm going to put it off. He said, let's get to know each other better. So over three months, uh, he played with my head a couple of times. One time he called me and said, you know, he said, Ken, the thing that bothers me about you is you don't show your enthusiasm very well. I said, what? I'll be down there in five yeah, minutes. Right. You think that this thing, which is basically builds like the electronic infrastructure for big municipalities. No, what they did was they ran data processing operations. They, were called out, they weren't called outsourcing them, but that's what they were. They would send their highly trained, capable programmers and scientists into these companies and help them get the most they could get out of their computers. It's amazing. So you then become the guy who runs the firm where the, where they Well, say- I, I got that deal. I'd been made a partner before that. I was made a partner in 66. I got that deal and I felt pretty good about my, I was kind of full of myself, frankly. <laughs> you know, I think today I might be less arrogant than I was then, but I was floating around. I got this deal from all these other firms and I did it, blah, blah, blah. By the way, I didn't do it alone. Again, Mm -hmm. we had a team of people at Pressbridge that were fabulous. And when I gave this big number to Pro, 100 times earnings was an unheard of multiple. Yeah, and you got more than that. He got 115. He thought when he asked me driving through the tunnel to sign the papers in Jersey, he's, well, this is when you're going to tell me I'm not getting 100. I said, you're right. And he got a little perplexed. 
And his wife, Margaret, was in the car with me, and we were in the back seat of a limousine, two seats, looking at each other. And I said, yeah, you're not going to get 100 times earning. He said, see, Margaret, they're all alike up here, blah, 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 blah. I said, okay, look, if you want 100, that's okay with me. So then Margaret said, well, what were you going to do with it? I said, oh, I was going to do it at 115 times earnings, but if he only wants 100. Yeah, that's fine. We did it at 115 times earnings, by the way. It was a good do, as it we was, say. It was, and by the way, I think of that company with enormous respect. They had, they had the most wonderful people in the company. They were motivated. They were high class. They were very professional. Lots of military people in that fr- bunches company, of don't right? forget. This is this is kids coming out of Vietnam. Yeah. We had and he had these kids and he gave them opportunities. Mm-hmm. He gave them awesome responsibilities and the ability to make decisions. And if they made bad decisions, it wasn't the end of their career. We'll get back to our interview with Ken Langone in just a minute. If you get a chance, go to JillOnMoney.com. That's our website. Sign up for our free weekly newsletter. It's free. And while you're there, maybe you even want to buy my book. I haven't plugged that in a while. Buy the book. It's in paperback now. All right, we'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and it's hour two. And over the last month or so, maybe six weeks, we've been talking um, to you directly. We've been taking your questions and answering them. But over the last couple of weeks, we feel like we need a little bit of injection of a different voice, a more positive voice sometimes, because it's pretty scary out there. So today we are resurrecting an old interview that we had done with Ken Langone. In this part of our interview, he talks about how he came to learn about a little business, just a little one called The Home Depot. It wasn't his idea, The Home Depot, but just think of it this way. Without Ken Langone, there is no national brand called The Home Depot. It's just a dinky little standalone location. He is the juice that got this thing going. Here's more of our interview with Ken Langone. So I want to just flash forward, and I would love for you to tell the story of Bernie Marcus, Arthur Blank, and the roots of The Home Depot. Okay. The roots started... A very good friend of mine in Philadelphia, Gary Obam, had a chain of home centers who I had brought public called Panorama. And they were experiencing difficulties, 75, 76. And Gary had hired me as a consultant. And we were in his office one day, and I said, look, I said, we ought to have a model. If we're going to fix this, we got to look who's, who's the best out there. Now, the home center industry then was regional. You had Rickle, Pergamon, Channel here. You had Heckinger's in the Mid-Atlantic. You had Scotty's in Florida. And you had Handy Dan and Angel's out in the way. He's, so Gary says, Ken, Ken is a guy out there, Bernie Marcus. He's fabulous. Does a great job. I said, okay, can you get me an appointment? Long story short, the next day, I was in L.A. having lunch with Bernie Marcus. And I met him, and then and now, spectacular human being. And we bonded. And... He was running a company that was 19% owned by the public and 81% owned by an industrial company called Dalen. I ended up buying almost all of 19% in the market. I kept buying it and buying it for myself and for clients. And he persuaded me one day to sell my stock to the guy that owned 81%. And I said, look, the guy doesn't like you, and he's going to fire you. And he said, no, no, he needs me. He doesn't know the business. I said, I'm telling you, I'm warning you. No. Nope. So this guy paid me a very significant premium to buy us out, all of myself and my investors. Four months after he bought us out, he fired Bernie, he fired Arthur, he fired Ron Brill. And Bernie calls me up, no health insurance, no stock, no income, three kids. I need a job. I said, yeah, forget about a job. When can you come to New York? And the next day he comes to New York. We sit in the Peacock Alley at the Waldorf Astoria with him, myself, and a fellow by the name of Jerry Grossman, uh, a lawyer, a labor lawyer. And they had committed a labor law violation. That's all it was, civic. Mm-hmm. It means the union gets certified. Bernie earlier had told me that we owned the stock for two years. In that two-year period, Bernie and I used to go walk store openings. When they were opening a new store, I'd go with them, and it was wonderful. And one walk in Houston, 
he says to me, don't get too excited because somebody's going to figure out the Achilles heel and it's going to change this industry. I don't know. He said, well, tell me. I said, tell me. No, no, I can't. I can't. No, I'm not going to tell you. So when he got fired, I said, he comes to New York. I said, all right, you just got hit in the ass with a golden horseshoe. Let's do that thing you said is going to change the industry. He said, what do you mean? And I t- reminded him, and he said to me, let's do it. And we initially went to Perot, and it wasn't going to work. So I went and lined up 40 people that all had done very well with Handy Dan, and we put together $2 million, Arthur, Bernie, and right after we incorporated, they found another guy, a merchandise and genius by the name of Pat Farah, mm-hmm. and we brought him on board. And he, he was two months after we were founded, but he was effectively one of the founders of the company as well. And the rest is history. So one thing that I found interesting was that uh, started with a... The aim was to open four stores in Atlanta. Two of them opened, but it was not. We had cool, we had no hell. Early on, Bernie was standing in front of the store, offering people a dollar if they would walk in and look what was in the store. And why do you think that was? Because the concept was so new. Yeah, it was brand new. When you had this huge, and you know, we had challenges. We didn't have a lot of money, and so when they were negotiating with the vendors, we got the vendors because we didn't want to have empty shelves. They gave us empty boxes with their labels on them, so people thought we had all this merchandise and all the overheads it was air. Mm. Mm. So when did you have the sense that it was going to really be as big as it became? What was the beginning when you were sitting? When, when Bernie got fired. Talk about that. I, look, I Bernie is fabulous. And I knew Bernie was going to be a big success. And Bernie knew the business. Bernie had a great knack for having good people around him. That's critical. Mm-hmm. So I had a good start there, and Bernie had, and we still have a very close relationship. Mm -hmm. We had to persuade Arthur to come. He was not sure he wanted to do it. Pat Farrow was running his own store, which was was doing very well in terms of physically, but financially it was a disaster, and eventually he had to bankrupt it. It was then we got Pat to join up with us, and we did it. But I never thought we'd have 400,000 employees, but I thought we had a chance to have a great business. So I want to talk a little bit about, I want to kind of finish the Home Depot section just by right. talking a little bit about how you have these founders. Obviously, it's getting big. There's different skill sets mm-hmm. of starting something right. and being mm-hmm. entrepreneurial right. and running a mature organization. Right. So talk a little bit about finding Arthur's successor. Okay. Bernie, Arthur, and I had agreed that we didn't have anybody in the company that if something happened to Arthur. So we hired Hydric and Struggles. And it turns out at the time, coincidentally, I was on a board of General Electric, and this was, was, was when Jack Welch was going to make his decision about his successor. Unfortunately, he picked the wrong guy. It <laughs> turned out to be a disaster. Bob Nardelli was the only one, and Bob had done a great job. I was on the board of GE, and I saw the great as an operator. Yep. And this is what we needed. We, you know, we, we were growing. We were, don't forget, we were opening 200 stores a year then, staggering amount of stores, and it was getting away from us. And so we brought Bob in. In fairness, Bob did a great job for four years. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, he sort of lost how whatever it was, what he had done in the first four years left a lot to be desired. And we had to make a change. We had a serious morale issue in the store. What do you think, in your mind, could you have identified some of Nardelli's weaknesses early on? I can't answer it objectively. Bob got caught up in whatever it was. But it was beginning to unravel this culture, this very precious culture we had about these kids that work in the stores. We'll get back to our interview with Ken Langone in just a minute. Here is a great idea during your break, because you're going to have a break and I'm going to have a break. Why don't you subscribe to our podcast? The podcast is called Jill on Money, and we do it daily now, daily You can get it on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Radio.com, Google Play, anywhere else you find your favorite podcast. Don't be afraid. Podcasts is just like radio, but you get to listen to it when you would like to listen to it. That's it. Very easy. Okay, we'll be right back. Four hundred one ks, IRAs, refinancing. She covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You are back. It's Jill on Money, and we are bringing to you an encore performance. 
That is of a great interview that we did. I don't, what year was it that we did this, Mark? I can't remember now. I think it was 2018. It's with Ken Langone, and he is a an investor, a private equity investor, an investment banker, a philanthropist. He's one of the guys who put the money behind the Home Depot. Uh, was basically the investment banker to Ross Perot for many years. So, in this last part of the interview. I just thought we had to put this front and center because Ken Langone talks about how he met Bernie Madoff, how Bernie Madoff was approaching him to invest money in Madoff Securities. And a funny thing happened on the way to Madoff. Ken Langone got a little bit of a weird vibe. He didn't describe it as a weird vibe. I describe it as a weird vibe. And so here to conclude our interview with Ken Langone, his Madoff story. It's a good one. So stay tuned. So I want to end because Mark is obsessed with Bernie Madoff. We have had okay. Diana Henriquez, who wrote The Wizard of Lies on the program. Right. She's a friend of mine. Mm. And um, you were featured in the movie version of that. Not exactly the right way to recount the story. So, But it uh, didn't happen that way. Yeah, exactly. That's what I want. I want to hear what happened when you met Bernie Madoff. Okay. 2008, in the middle of the crash, the week Lehman Brothers went broke, yep. we sold a company we had a big interest in called Choice Point to Reed Elsevier for cash. And thank God for Marty Lipton and his firm, Ed Hurley and the gang. They wrote a contract with Reed Elsevier that you couldn't get a drop of water through. Mm -hmm. Reed tried to claim force majeure. Mm -hmm. and we said, uh-uh, mm -hmm. we're settling. And so we got... Friday night of the same week that Lehman went broke. <laughs> you got a big wire in. We got $4.3 billion in cash. <laughs> that wasn't all ours, but we had a good piece. Yeah. A very dear friend of mine, a wonderful man, called me up and said, look, Bernie Madoff would like to meet you. This was a month and a half after that, in November. He said, well, why don't you meet with him? And so I have a partner that lived out in Sun Valley then, and I called up Steve Holzman, and I said, Steve, do me a favor. I said, I'm going to meet this guy Madoff. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. I said, but you probably might, because Steve understood all these different strategies and stuff. So Steve came in, and for the first 40, we're in his offices in the Lipstick Building on 3rd mm -hmm. Avenue. He's showing me all this art like I really care. And finally, I said, Bernie, i got to go to a dinner. And I said, can we sit down and talk? And he's sure. So he sits down, and he starts talking about this and that and the other thing, and this put and that call and this straddle. And I'm sitting there, my eyes are glazing over. And Steve is listening. And then he says to me, and look, he said, I can only take $500 million for this deal. He said, it's not big enough for me to give all of my existing clients, so I'm going to give it to you. Uh, my first reaction was, wait a minute, how would I feel if I was one of his clients? And I found out he's got this phenomenal bird's nest on the ground, but he's given it to a guy he's never done business with before and keep me out of it. I didn't say anything. I said, well, Bernie, i got to leave for dinner, and so we thanked him. We got in the elevator, we went downstairs, and I said, Steve, I don't want to do business with this guy. I thanked him very much. I said, I don't want to do business with this guy. He said, why? I said, look, if he's going to screw his existing customers, I might be the next one to get screwed. I don't want to do it. I said, I think it's bad faith not to offer this deal, which is supposed to be a slam dunk deal to his people. Mm -hmm. He said, well, let me think about it. So the Friday after Thanksgiving of that week, Steve called me and said, you know, Ken, you're right. I don't want to do it. I said, well, do me a favor. Call him up and be polite and respectful. Just tell him we're going to pass. And that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. Hollywood likes license. You know, they need drama. Exactly. Meeting this guy, he was teetering on the edge of... He was slick. He really? I wouldn't want to play poker with this guy. He knew he was going down when he right. was talking to us. That's what I think, like, timing-wise. If I was playing poker with this guy, he'd have all my clothes. He'd have all my houses. <laughs> he'd have... This guy was Mr. Cool. I want to wrap up, and um, I know that the that capitalism is sort of the theme of the book and why you love it. That's really the story of your life. I want to also point out a couple of the things that mm. you say that um, you have curiosity. You are notorious for asking more questions than any other director on a board. Yep. Um, I didn't give a blank if my question showed how stupid I was. You also... I guess what's interesting is that um, you note that this is not a zero-sum game. And you, you say in the book you were a lifelong Republican for some time. Mm -hmm. But you also have said, spoken publicly about how you're concerned about income inequality. Absolutely. Could you explain that a little bit? Sure. If the gap between 
the well-off and the not-so-well-off gets big enough, you put the people that are not so well off to say, hey, you know what, nothing's working for me. What happens? You get a Cuba, you get a Venezuela, you get a Russia. We've got to figure a way out to bring everybody to the party. The most exciting thing to me about Home Depot, a lot of things about it, we have 3,000 kids today who started in the parking lot, fresh out of high school, pushing carts in. They're multimillionaires. Is that because of the stock, or they work their way up? Yeah, no, 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 stock. No, no, we give them options and stock savings. Look, I think of my mother and father. They were down at that end of the spectrum, and I know how they struggle. Mm -hmm. We've got to do a better job. I don't have all the answers, but I know we we can't allow these people, all of us as as citizens, we can't allow these people to not participate in this great dream called America. Thanks again to Ken Langone, who showed up so graciously a couple of years ago with no fanfare, with no entourage, just a guy, just came in by himself. It was great. If you would like to hear more of in these kinds of interviews, all you have to do is go to our archive. Just go to JillOnMoney.com, click the Listen tab, and there's all sorts of interviews with folks that you may not have heard in the first time around. So check it out. JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. back. And before we go for the day, for the weekend, I just want to remind you, you should feel free to send us emails all week long. Just take this down. Put it in your head. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Okay. This is from Dan who writes, my wife and I have been struggling with whether to pay off the remainder of my variable rate student loan, $28,000 and her car loan, $5,000. She lost her job with school being canceled for the year. She's unable to return to work. We are not collecting as she worked under the table. Oh, brother. Okay. Um, Altogether, we lost a substantial amount of money every month. So we're trying to reduce that loss by canceling certain debts. We are struggling to keep our head above water. And while we have been fortunate to avoid touching the savings, we're hesitant to pay off the loans as we will not have much remaining if she were to stay out of work for longer than a few months. And we do need that cushion. Okay. So number one, get in touch with the lenders, the student loan, It doesn't sound like it's a federal loan, so it's probably a private lender. Get in touch with with that lender. And then also get in touch with a car loan company. Tell them that you have been negatively impacted by the COVID-19 virus and ask for what is called forbearance, meaning ask for a break. You're right. Your inclination to not want to spend that money is spot on. You want to try to conserve that money and try not to dip into it. So let's go with that route first before you take the money to pay it any of those loans off. Okay. I'm so sorry about your wife. It's another good reason, by the way, that when people say to me, oh, what's, you know, aren't I smart to get paid under the table and no taxes? Yeah, but you don't get entitled. You don't, you're not entitled to any benefits either, including unemployment. So there's a dark side to that world also, not to mention it's illegal. Okay, that's it. That's the program. We have been broadcasting live from the Policy Genius Virtual Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. You can go to policygenius.com. And throughout the week, if you need any help, just send us an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Okay, thanks for listening. Stay safe. Practice that social distancing. Wear your masks and be nice to somebody. We'll talk to you next week. 